at our first passage of Scripture in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And tonight we're going to talk about blessed. What does it mean to be blessed? If you looked around in our world, you might get a little bit confused at what blessed might mean. I saw a lady a few weeks ago drunk wearing a necklace that said blessed. I've seen people decorate their home with it, the sign that says blessed, living my best life ever with no Bible to be found. We live in a world that has equated blessed with physical treasures, wealth, uh, cars, uh, influence, jobs, and everything else. We even have Christian preachers that are confused at what blessed really means. Blessed is not living my best life ever. Blessed is the divine favor of God upon my life in the good times and the bad times. So how would you answer the question if someone was to ask you, how do you know that, this is a rhetorical question, I'm going to say that before everybody starts shouting at me. How do you know that you are blessed? How do you know that you're blessed? If you were asked that question, how would you answer? Would it be to say, I have healthy children, that's what makes me blessed? Would you say, uh, we paid off our home last year, that's what makes me blessed? Um, I, I got a new job and I love it, that's what makes me blessed. But as a believer, as a follower of Jesus, Jesus Christ. What does the Bible say about us being blessed? Before we go into answering that for ourselves from the Bible, let me define for you blessed. Blessed is from the Greek word makarios. This Greek word makarios carries the meaning of privileged recipient of divine favor. Privileged recipient of divine favor. Let me give you four good reasons. And there are, mark my word, a whole lot more than four. But for the sake of time and to keep me within the parameters, I'm giving you four tonight. We are blessed because, number one, we are chosen by God. We are chosen by God. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 4. Look at it with me. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Did you notice there that it says at the beginning of that verse 3, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Nothing was mentioned there about your job, your paycheck, your family, your home, the car you drive, or the city that you live in. None of that was mentioned there. We're not blessed by those things. Those things are nice. They get us by between here and heaven. But those aren't the things that prove that we're blessed in our lives. First and foremost, we're blessed in our lives because we are chosen by by God. Simon Peter wrote this in 1 Peter chapter 2. He said this, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him. What? Who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You and I are chosen by God, and because we've been chosen by him, that makes us a blessed people. Let the church say amen. Number two. We are blessed because we are forgiven. We are blessed because we are forgiven. Psalm chapter 32 verses 1 through 2 say this. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Folks, if you ever have to have one of those kind of days where it just seems like everything's going wrong, you just, you know, everything that used to not hurt now hurts more than you ever thought it could hurt, and everything in your life just seems to be such a drudgery, and you're having a difficult time in trying to figure out what you can praise God for, what you can thank God for, or you're just having a hard time believing you're blessed. Remind yourself of this one thing. You are a blessed child of God because...
because you have been forgiven of all of your sins. All of them taken away. That's the only reason we can even have this joyful relationship with the Lord. It's the only reason we can even have within our lives the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, and all the rest of them. It's the only reason that we have the hope of glory that Paul writes about, Jesus Christ living in our hearts. It's the reason why we are the holy temple of the Holy Spirit of God. We are all of those things and more, first and foremost, because we have been forgiven of all of our sins. I love how First John put it. John put it in such an eloquent way. He said, if we confess our sins, that lets us know right up front in First John 1, 9, that lets us know right up front that we have a decision to make. We have sin in our life. We can either confess it or hold on to it. We can either confess it and give it to God and seek for forgiveness of it, or we can coddle and hold on to it or hide it or try to, or try to enjoy both sides of the life. And let me tell you, the most miserable place in the world for any human being to ever be is to try to enjoy a relationship with God and try to engage in sin at the same time. It's a miserable place. You can't fully enjoy God because of the sin you're practicing in your life. And you can't fully enjoy the pleasure sin promises because you know too much about God. It is a miserable place to be. So the choice is, if we confess our sins, here's the good news. He, speaking of God, is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And He takes it all away from you. He doesn't take a little bit away from you. When you come to God and you confess your sins, they are all blotted out. They're all washed away. They're all covered up in the blood of Jesus Christ. And they have all been forgiven. And we are made righteous. That is why you and I are blessed. The Bible is very clear that we are blessed because we are chosen. We're blessed because we are forgiven. But number three, we also are blessed because we are instructed by God. Because we're instructed by God. Look in Psalms chapter 94 verses 12 and 13. The psalmist writes these words, Blessed is the man whom you instruct. He's speaking to God. Blessed is the man whom you instruct, O Lord, and teach out of your law that he may that you may give him rest from the days of adversity. With God instructing us, that in and of itself makes you and I blessed. This communication with God, this, this, this teaching atmosphere. I'm, you are sitting here tonight and you are listening and engaging with the teaching and the preaching that's going on tonight. And you're receiving a certain level of instructions of what God's Word says and how we're supposed to live. This interaction with God's Word, your interaction in prayer with God, and the way that God leads and guides and directs your life is another other way that we can answer the question, how do I know I'm blessed? Because I have the instructions of God leading and guiding my life. In fact, keep a place here. I really want you to take a look at this with me. 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and verses 16 and 17. It's a very familiar passage of Scripture, but the problem with it being very familiar is it loses the punch sometimes. Uh, it becomes so familiar that, that while you're listening to me rattle off the verse, you're going, oh yeah, and you're opening up your notes app and reminding yourself of something you're supposed to do at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. Because we're so familiar with it. Billy Graham said it himself. He said, the most beautiful verse in the Bible is John 3, 16. But the tragic thing about it is every believer thinks they know everything about John chapter 3, verse 16. You and I, when we have this familiarity to it, there's a phrase that describes it, familiarity. When we have that familiarity, it breeds apathy in our lives. It, it's, it's one of the things that happen. We begin to take it for granted. We begin to just assume there's nothing else there new to learn. It happens in relationships. We see it in pastoral counseling. We see it in marriages all the time. When you've been married over a long period of time, if you're not careful that familiarity that you have with one another, you begin to take each other for granted. And it's one of the reasons that in pastoral counseling we encourage that couples get away from the kids and even grandkids I know that sounds, uh, it sounds wrong, I know it does but get away from everybody just the two of you so that you can go on a second 
Did you ever notice it's usually only the women that answer that question when I say that? <laughs> second honeymoon. And you go on that second honeymoon because you want to remind yourself of how you first fell in love and what it is that you love about the other person, setting aside the familiarity and renewing that first love again. I think sometimes we need to do the same exact thing with God's Word again because we carry it around and it's in our phone. I've got it in a version Bible app that I use on my phone all the time. I've got it on my laptop. I've got it on my iPad. I've got my Bible that I carry right here. I keep a Bible in my car for goodness sakes in case I ever get somewhere and need something to read and I run out of battery space in my, in my phone, you know. Uh, I mean, you go to the average Christian home and there's probably three or four Bibles laying around the house. And because of all this familiarity, we forget that this is the God-breathed instructions of God for your life and mine. We, we forget sometimes how holy and divine and powerful that this Word of God is that He's given to us. And, and, we, and we catch ourselves going long periods of time of coming to God's Word and reading it out of discipline and out of habit, but missing the wow factor. Missing the awe and the grandeur and the, and the holiness and the godliness and the, and the isn't that cool factor of the Bible. And Paul, right before he died, reminding us of things that he considered most important in the life of a believer, one of those he wanted to remind us of how important God's Word is. And he said this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. He said, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Inspiration of God there in the original Greek literally means God breathed. It means God breathed. It means God breathed it. He, he breathed this Word upon the human authors that wrote it down. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And here it is, and is profitable. That word profitable for all the note takers I see in the room tonight. That word profitable also means beneficial and advantageous. So God's Word for you is not only profitable, but it's beneficial and advantageous for your life. He says it is profitable for doctrine. Doctrine is not a bad word. It's right here in the Bible. It's a good word. It's a solid word. It teaches us the things about God so that we can put our faith in something that is rock solid that will never move. One of the things that's a doctrine that is rock solid, and that is this. Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world. And when you ask Him to forgive you of your sins, you are forgiven of your sins and now have a relationship with God. That is a doctrine of salvation that once you know it and you believe it, you can stand on it. It's firm and it will not move again. Let the church say amen. He goes on and says it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof. Nobody likes this, including your four-year-old grandchild that gets in trouble. Nobody likes to be reproved, but it's one of the elements of God's Word. It's one of the ways that God's Word works in our life. There are times that I read God's Word, and there are sometimes that it's as sweet as honey. It makes my heart sing. It makes my life excited. And there are other times that I open up the Bible and read it, and God says, Jonathan, uh, that one's for you. And I'm like, yeah, God, I don't really do that, God. That's not me, Jonathan. That one's for you. But, but God, I mean, I mean... I don't really have any good examples of how I did that, God. You know, Jonathan, that one's for you, you know. There are those times that God's Word is to reprove us, to, to, to make you and I more godly and more like Christ and more like who He is and who He wants us to be. Uh, it goes on. It says also that the Bible is beneficial for you and I for correction in our life. Those times when God corrects us where He says, walk in this way. Stop walking in this other way. Don't do this. Do this instead. Then listen to this. And it says this, for instruction in righteousness. All of these things are beneficial, advantageous, profitable for your life for the reason of verse 17. Verse 16 and 17 in the original Greek language is one run-on theme, one run-on paragraph, one run-on truth that's being given here. And it says this, that the man of God may be what? Complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. You and I, when we receive the instructions of God from His Word is more proof 
proof that you and I are blessed. When God speaks to you, whether it's to tell you, good job, keep going this way, do it this way, or God uses His Word to say, don't do this, stop doing this in your life, I need you to be more like this. All of those things are proof that God has blessed you and I because we're receiving the instructions of God in our life. Number four is this. We can know that we are blessed because we are those who keep God's Word. We are those who keep God's Word. It's not just enough to know the Word, to be instructed in it, but we must be keepers of the Word of God. Keepers of the Word of God. My wife and I, depending on if she takes her purse or not, and depending on whether I'm wearing sweatpants or blue jeans, sometimes I ask my wife to hold my wallet for me. Uh, it's never really thrilling for her because it's empty, you know. Uh, but I like holding her wallet because it's full of cash. <laughs> So when I hold her wallet, it's a little bit more of a defensive move. i got to be sure nobody gets that one. Somebody takes mine, it's like, okay, I make a couple of phone calls, I'm done. You know, <laughs> they take her wallet, we're in trouble, you know, <laughs> kind of a thing. But she's asking me to keep it for her. She's giving me something that is of value, something that has some, some level of worth, something that needs a, a, uh, a protector, something that needs someone to take care of it and move it from this place to the next to the next. The same thing in a certain way is true of you and I when it comes to God's Word. It's not just enough to know God's Word. That's never been enough. It's never enough to just know. No more than it's enough to know that there are unsaved people in the world and never tell anybody about Jesus Christ. It's a failure. That's not evangelism. Evangelism isn't knowledge that I know there are lost people in Overland Park. I mean, you know, if somebody comes up to me and goes, there's so many unsaved people in Overland Park, and I'm like, duh. I mean, in my family, there's unsaved people. I mean, so let's, you know, just expand that out to the, the general population and the percentages and stuff. There's unsaved people everywhere. It's not enough to know it. It's only enough if I know it and do something about it. That I tell somebody about Jesus Christ. It's not enough that you know this is the Word of God. We just covered that in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. That alone, that one verse there alone tells you how incredible this Word of God is. That it came straight from Him, straight to us, for a very specific reason. It's not enough just to know that. It's only enough when we know it and we keep His Word. That we are the ones that are not only hear the Word of God, but as you know around Abundant Life Church, we also... Do the Word of God. I, want to, I find it interesting, and I want to point it out to you here in your study guide, that the book of Revelation begins with the blessing of those for those who keep the Word of God, and it closes the book with the same blessing for those who keep the Word of God. It's very fascinating. It's the only book that does that. And let's look at it together. Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. John writes these words, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and, so remember, it's not enough just to read it, it's not enough just to hear it, and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. i, I got to tell you something. If when Revelation was written long before you and I were ever born, <laughs> and when it was written, and God considered for you and I to know that the time is near, how much closer are we to it now than then? How much closer? The end is near. And because the end is near, there's almost more of an urgency, more of a clarion call for you and I to be those who not only hear and not only read the Word of God and hear the Word of God, but that we keep those things that are written in it. That's the beginning of the book. Let's go to the last chapter of this book in chapter 22, verses 7 and 14. And it says this, Behold, I am coming quickly. This is God speaking. John writing the words of Jesus here. And then he's, so I'm going to read that line again since you know that. Behold, Jesus speaking, I am coming quickly. Blessed 
is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. The gates into the city here speaking of heaven. Speaking of heaven. You see, you and I need to be those that hear the Word of God and do the Word of God. Uh, one of the places where revival broke out in previous generations was from a schoolroom in Topeka, Kansas. They had a simple philosophy when it came to Bible study. These few students that gathered there, the teacher that was there, they would open their Bibles where they left off at, they'd read a passage of Scripture, they'd kneel down and pray about it, then they would do it. That ushered in what we know to eventually become a Pentecostal movement, specifically influencing the Assemblies of God. It's that element of hearing God's Word and doing God's Word. Can you imagine how frustrated God must get with us when we do things we know we're not supposed to do and we already read about it so we know we're not supposed to do it but we still do it anyways or we ignore doing it even though we read about it and we know all about it and we can quote the verse. It's kind of like when your child does something you know they knew better than not to do. Son, what were you thinking? You know better than that. Why did you do that? Or on another occasion, they just didn't do something. You know I told you to make your bed. Why does it look like the tornado came through your window in your room? I told you what to do. You knew to do it. The frustration we have as a parent. Can you imagine after all that God has done to make us thoroughly complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work, and God has to look down from heaven and go, but you know. You know that one. I, I can't believe you overlooked that. Come on, daughter, son, what are you thinking? We need to do this. You and I need to be those that give ourselves to not only the hearing of the Word of God, but the doing of the Word of God. It's not even just enough to memorize it. I mean, when I was a little kid, my mom, she would put out these little cards, like index card things, and she'd write Bible verses on there that she wanted us to memorize. And I, I'm not for sure what her full intentions of this tactic was, but the verse was on the table, and somehow or another, after you read the verse memorized it, you got breakfast. <laughs> Just saying, not sure where she learned that from. I don't know if that's a World War II tactic with POWs or I don't know, but you know, uh, that's how we learned the Word of God. It was just every morning. It was just a part of what we did. And I can tell you this, after many years of not serving the Lord, after many years of being a drug addict, after many years of being away from the Lord and coming back to Jesus Christ, asking Him to forgive me of my sins, it's incredible the number of verses and even whole chapters my mother had us memorize came flooding back, right back into my life and right back into my soul. The night I was saved, I was able to quote Psalms 23 from beginning to end in King James without missing a single verb, single word. I could quote John 3.16 and a host of other verses throughout the Bible that were taught to me and memorized when I was a child. Now I have the responsibility as a believer in Christ now that I know those words, what will I do with those words of God? So this is how it should be, should take place in our life. You get up tomorrow morning or whenever it is that you do your devotional time, I suggest in the morning, the only reason I say that is, for years I did it in the evening time. And uh, I found that when I got to the evening time, a lot of times I was tired. Uh, I had a lot, a lot of things on my mind. And I found that there's a lot of clear thinking in the morning. Typically, if you get up before everybody else, it's a little quieter around the house early in the morning. And also, the other thing is I tend to learn more during that time of the morning. And the psalm says, in the book of Psalms chapter 5, it says, early in the morning I will seek you, and a number of other places that talk about that. But getting alone with God, and you read the Bible, and you pray, then how about we just actually go out that day and say, how can I do the very thing that I just learned about? So, let's say tomorrow you're reading about, love your enemies as yourself. Let's just pick, let's just pick one of those, okay? Love your enemies as yourself. I'm confident, if you travel very many places in this city, you will at least find somebody who may not be an enemy, but might at a minimum cut you off on 435 or give you an attitude at the store or something other else and present to you an incredible opportunity to love them. Novel, isn't it? 
that we would actually put that into practice. Why is that important? Let me give you this verse as we get ready to uh, come to our prayer time. James chapter 1 verse 25. Write that down, listen to me, read it, or turn there with me. But James 1 25. James writing and he said, But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, this is speaking of God's word and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of that word, this one will be blessed in what he does. I find it interesting. A lot of people want to be blessed. They just don't want what it takes to be blessed. We want the easy way to be blessed, and we think the easy way to be blessed is to go to Hobby Lobby, buy a sign that says blessed in real pretty colors, hang it in our home, Instagram it and Facebook, and put it online to let everybody know, living my best life ever. Truth is, that has zero to do with a blessed life. Good home, good home decor idea, but it has zero, zero to do with being truly blessed by God. Blessed by God is at least these four things. There are many others, but at least these four. But the one that you and I should look to the most, which will influence all that we do on this earth if we grab a hold of it, is found in Matthew chapter 25. It's at the end of your study guide. And I want you to listen and follow along with, it, with me on this one. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then he, speaking of Christ, will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations, not some of them, every pagan nation, every godly nation, every godless nation, every nation will be gathered before him. And Jesus will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he'll set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, these are the sheep, he will say, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now before we go further, pause right here. I love that verse. I long to hear that word. I really do. I long to be standing before my Lord and Savior, the one who died for my sins, the one who called me and made me his child to stand before him and say to me, blessed. To tell me I'm blessed and to tell me even further, come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom, prepare for me for the foundation of the world. But I want you to know that being blessed and entered into that kingdom has less to do with memorizing a verse as much as it does with doing the verse. See, when it all boils down to this, the only difference between the sheep and the goats in this story, and we're only going to read about the sheep tonight, the only difference between the two in this scenario is what they did and did not do. One knew what to do and did it. It's a lifestyle. Such a lifestyle, they didn't even realize they were doing it. Christ had to point it out to them. Those that were turned away from God, not blessed by God, were those that did not do the right things or the things that God had called them to. So let's see what some of those are. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. I want to be blessed by God. You know what else I want? I want my family to be blessed by God. But the blessing isn't something that you buy at a store. It's not something you, uh, you aspire to in this life in the way the world thinks of being blessed. It's found in knowing God, knowing His Word, and doing all that God has called us to do. To do it with a heart of love, 
because we love the Lord our God with all our mind, body, and soul, and we love our neighbor as ourselves. And when we do those things, we find the blessed life. Guess what? Forget going to buy the book, okay? You can have your blessed life by opening this book, reading it, and doing what it says to do. This week, you know, beginning tonight, you can begin to lead a blessed life like never before by simply going right here to the very thing that you have the most access to and put it to use in your life. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you. We continue, God, to be grateful for you because it's another evening of hearing from your word, God. Another evening of hearing from you, God. Another evening of sharing testimonies. Another evening of great fellowship that we've enjoyed with one another, God. The laughter I could hear going on in the sanctuary before service and the people talking and encouraging one another. Father, we're blessed because, yes, you have forgiven us and you've chosen us. You continue to instruct us like you have tonight, God. But, Father, you've also given us the ability to not only hear your word, but the opportunity to do your word. So, Father, I ask you that you would help us to be people that do just that. That we would be the children that are blessed because we rise up and say, God, your word said so, and here I go. God, I read this and now I'm on my way. God, I read this and I know today there will be some way, somehow, this will be able to be done for someone else today. Give us that kind of a life, God. Give us that kind of a desire, God, to want to live a blessed life because of what you give us, not this world, but what you give us. And we thank you for it. Stand and let's sing this song.